All right, welcome everybody. As uh, Brother James mentioned, we are in the book of First Corinthians and we're pressing on through chapter one. Uh, today will be the subsection in which Paul begins to address what the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God uh, is all about and why it is that as we uh, look at the root cause of the divisions at the Corinthian church, it was in fact carnal pride that was uh, having them be divided. So let us read the scripture for today. Uh, if you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. We will be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. The infallible word of God with absolute authority reads as follows. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise in the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. Thank you that you entered your own creation, that you were sent but God, by God the Father, to save us from our sins. We pray that your Holy Spirit may give us the wisdom that comes from you, that is godly, humble wisdom. And that we, we may repent from any proud and arrogant worldly wisdom. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so I've titled today's sermon, the word of the cross is foolishness. There has been at least a couple of instances in which I have preached the gospel either publicly in the open square or individually to somebody. And they've straight out told me what you were telling me is stupidity. It is foolish. You are a fool. To which I reply, the Bible actually says that. The Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness. While that is true, of course, there is a clever turn here. Because the context in which the Bible says that it is to condemn, to condemn those who think such. We're going to look at that today. But let's rewind just a little bit. In the past two weeks, what have we talked about? We talked about the first exhortation of the Apostle Paul to the Church of Corinth, and that is that there were divisions in the church. What happened is that after Paul planted the Church of Corinth and left, he received reports that within the church, there were being cliques that were formed. And within those factions, they were coming against each other. And such things shouldn't be neither in the local church nor in the church at large. So let us recap what the church was dividing over. Verse 12 says this. What I mean is that each of one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas or I follow Christ. And the point was, was that these types of claims to division were carnal in nature. They were sinful in nature. They were claiming allegiance according, as we saw last week, to who was who had baptized them. I got baptized by this leader, so I follow him, or I baptized by this other leader, so I'm going to follow him. And so on went in their divisions. And Paul's telling them that they should be united around Christ and him crucified, buried, and resurrected, and not around the preference over whoever have, has baptized them. So as we go into today's text, we can think of entering into a subsequent or a subset of an exhortation, which in a way addresses our first one. The same division, as we have mentioned, 
was a matter of carnal pride. This pride produces a feeling of false humility, of arrogance, of superiority from one believer to the one that's next to him. That would be what the Bible calls boasting in yourself or boasting in someone else in a sinful way. What we will see then today is that that kind of human arrogant wisdom, preference, division is nothing but foolishness disguised as wisdom. Now, as we focus on the subject of wisdom, which will essentially be this week and next week, the Bible warns us about carnal wisdom, about letting ourselves be influenced by our own ideas or by worldly ideas, and us think that we are actually being wise when, in essence, we're being foolish. And let us remember that Scripture encourages us to have wisdom, to have discernment, but to have godly discernment. For instance, Proverbs 14, verse 8 says this, The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. So then we see this pattern in Scripture that we are encouraged, we are commanded to utilize discernment, wisdom, prudence. And that such wisdom will be granted to us if we ask God to give us that wisdom. That wisdom comes from God himself. And we are told in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 6, that if we lack wisdom to ask God, and he will be faithful to give us that wisdom. So then, if we don't seek that type of wisdom and we think that we are wise, as the Bible says, in our own eyes, it is foolishness. And that foolishness results in our judgment. Let's keep that in mind as we explore today's passage. I have two headers today. The first header is this. Is the question, why is the word of the cross foolishness? The majority of people on earth think this. Why do people think this? Why is the word of the cross foolishness? Verse 18 reads, For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So let us look at the immediate context of this verse. When Paul opens up this verse by saying, For the word of the cross, it's making a conclusion about something that came right before it. What was it? Let's look at it. Verse 17 says this. For Christ did not send me to baptize. Remember, they were being divisive because of who baptized him. Paul says, I wasn't sent for that. But what he was sent for? To preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So the concern, divisions in the church, believers dividing into sets of who baptize them, ungodly preferences. And Paul's correction is, listen up. Christ did not send me to baptize. While that's important, that's not the most important thing. The important thing is to preach the gospel. In that preaching was not done with eloquent wisdom, with flowery language. Remember how we saw last week that Part of the appeal of Corinth was public speaking. This was a Mecca where entertainers, speakers, orators would come and amaze everyone with their storytelling, with their riddles, with their maybe even comedy. And crowds were drawn to hear these speakers and their ability for speech. Paul says, I have none of that. And the reason I have none of that is because he makes it a point that the power of what is being preached in itself will be what changes people for eternity. And Paul says, if the message is not straightforward without all these intriguing and cleverly told stories, Paul says, then the emphasis will be on that 
in the cross will be emptied of its power. The attention is not where it should be. So then the gospel, when accurately and straightforward, when it's pretty straightforward, changes lives and changes the eternal path of individuals because of its inherent message and not because of the craftiness of the preacher or orator. In that context, keeping in mind that is what the audience highly values, eloquent speakers, those who can show that they are smart and wise, entertain crowds, so on and so forth. That is the setting in which Paul now says, for the word of the cross is follies, foolishness to all those people that expect me to entertain them. Please track with me here. Now let ex let's explore what the passage means. What is the word of the cross? Literal is logos, the word. Cross, stauros. Logos, stauros, the word of the cross. The message of Jesus being crucified. The reason for him coming. It is relatively straightforward. A child is able to understand it. Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God the Father, becoming a man, submitting himself to a sacrificial death by means of the most cruel way of torture, death by execution on a Roman cross. That is the message. God the Father sent his son to suffer this horrendous death in order to save sinners from the right punishment that they deserve for being enemies of God, worthy of eternal death in hell. That is, in short, the message of the cross. Now, why is it foolishness? I'm going to give a list of reasons of why this is foolishness to the average ear. Reason number one, straight up, because it simply does not make sense. I put that in quotes. In the eyes of worldly wisdom, it is inconceivable that the one being proclaimed as the ultimate hero, the one who literally saves the world from eternal doom, is one who accomplishes it by submitting to be put to death. That doesn't make sense. Let us look at one verse, Matthew 27, 35. It says this. This is the scene at the crucifixion. It says, and when they had crucified him, it's all said and done. They divided his garments among them by casting lots. This is one of the verses that tells us straightforward that Jesus was crucified. Now, the implications here are several. What do we mean when we say that, Chris, that Jesus was crucified? As Christians or even as ordinary hearers of that, we have sort of just bypassed it. It kind of just goes over our head. So let us be reminded, what does it mean to be crucified? It means that Jesus was publicly shamed, humiliated, beaten, stripped of his clothes. Jesus was receiving the treatment that was reserved for only the worst of criminals at that time. Jesus suffered the desperate, slow death that crucifixion would bring to the one being put to death by it. It is known by history in the study of the death by crucifixion that a person on, on the cross would be nailed by the hands and feet. And what happens is that they would have to hold themselves up because they're having trouble breathing after being in that position for an extended amount of time. And when the body senses that there's oxygen deprivation and that they need to breathe, Naturally, the body makes an impulse to push up. However, as the body pushes up as a natural instinct in order to breathe, the pain becomes all the more excruciating in the feet, in the legs, in the back, and on the arms. So therefore, the body gives up. 
and hangs again. And then you can't breathe again. And that goes back and forth over and over and over and over. The word excruciating, when somebody says excruciating pain, it is drawn from the scene of the crucifixion. In which the subject eventually goes between that phase of pushing up and letting down and pushing up and letting down and dies by suffocation. To the general public in Corinth, it was not something to be proud about, to be telling someone that a man who, who died such death is a savior, that such man is actually the creator of heaven and earth. It does not make sense. It did not make sense then, and it does not make sense now. Therefore, it is foolishness to him or her that hears the word of the cross. Second reason, why is it foolishness? Why is the word of the cross foolishness? Reason number two is because the message of the cross condemns the wisdom of men. The gospel calls out men for who he really is. Pay attention. That is. The word of the cross shines light on the fundamental truth that the natural man is a hater of God and a lover of self. Your natural inclinations is that you are a hater of God and you love yourself. And the gospel points that out to your face. Not only that, but such man, such woman is willing to die in his or her sin, convinced that they are right and that God is wrong. Imagine that. That is all of us. That is our natural disposition. Therefore, that is foolishness. But such foolishness to the natural man, he or she thinks that that is wisdom. Romans 1.22 says this, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Proverbs 14.12, it says this, there is a way that seems right to men, but its end is the way of what? Of death. I don't have it in the notes, but the beginning of chapter 14 says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's another great witnessing tool. Every time that I'm told there actually is no God, I tell them the Bible actually says that. And I quote them that verse. It is foolishness. But to the human mind, they think is wisdom. Reason number three, why is the word of the cross foolishness is this. Because the message of the cross calls sinners to repent and to faith in Christ and warns them of the unavoidable judgment to come. Acts 17 verses 30 and 31 says this. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands, who does he command? All people everywhere to repent. And then the reason why? Because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God has assured that he demands and expects repentance from all and that the day of judgment is coming. And that the reason why the hearer can take it to the bank is because Jesus already proved that everything he claimed is true. He resurrected from the dead. So the proclamation of the gospel then demands a response from the hearer. That is repentance, turning away from the natural path of sin that we are all born in and trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. 
with the promise that God will make you into new creation, that God will change your desires, that God will regenerate you. And that proclamation of the gospel to repent and put faith in Christ, to be born again, that's what it means, to those who have heard it, however, and yet rejected, the message will have greater judgment. It is foolishness because the message of repentance and turning from sin is not one that the natural person wants to receive. Next reason, why is the word of the cross foolishness? Well, because the warning of the consequence for rejecting the gospel, it just seems way far out there. Like it's maybe it'll happen someday, but if it does happen, I'll kind of come through at the last minute. Wrong. That is foolishness. One of the biggest lies of the devil is you have time. Maybe all this makes sense to you. You have time. My brothers and sisters, I preached at a funeral of an 18-year-old. If you're an adult in this room, you are past that. Make no mistake, death is after you. Psalm 90 verse 12 says this, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of, not foolishness, wisdom. Wisdom. Him who can acknowledge that the days are fading away, and that death is fast approaching, is wise. Proverbs 27, 21. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Don't boast about tomorrow. This is not only a warning for non-Christians that the day of salvation, of repentance, of faith in Christ is now, today, but this is also a constant warning to the professing Christian. Mainly, does your life reflect the obedience that God expects? And by God's grace, in some areas of our life, we can say, actually, yes, by God's grace, he's been working on me. However, for the life of the Christian, the follow-up is always, but the Lord is still working in me and there's work to do and I need to obey. Or if some of us are real, you can say, you know what? I'm not obeying and I know I'm not obeying and I'm not even struggling with it. I'm just going for it. So if you're in that camp, the day to repent, it's today. Next reason why the word of the cross is foolishness. Because God, God Almighty has hidden the truth from those who continue in the rebellion and who hate him. And he will give them over to a reprobate mind. Just remove the filters and let them go for it. Romans 1, 18 and 28 says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth of God. Verse 28, and since since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased, reprobate mind to do what ought not to be done. In short, the word of the cross, that is the gospel, demands a response of turning from sin and to obedience to God. But the natural man will suppress that truth. They know the truth, but they will suppress it. It is not something that the natural man either seeks or likes to hear. So God hides it from them and lets them go for the reprobate state. So then when the word of the cross is preached and is suppressed and resisted, it is only a matter of time before God will remove the common grace that he's had on them so that they could wallow in their depravity. All the sexual perversion that we see in our culture today is this type of judgment. 
people being turned over to a reprobate mind. And not only to them, but also to who? To those that support and enable and make laws approving of and those who celebrate them. Pay attention. God, by and large, has given this culture over to a reprobate culture. Now, there's more reasons of why the word of the cross is foolishness. But I think we covered good ground to get an idea of why. The natural man suppressing the truth of God, being an enemy of God, wants nothing to do with God, and they prefer their sin. So then, to whom is it foolishness? He gives us the answer. It says, the word of the cross is folly. To those who are perishing, those who perish, that is, those who are being lost, those who are being destroyed, those who are on their way to eternal damnation in hell, where Jesus says that there is gnashing of teeth, where the worm does not die, and where there is non ending torment. To those that are on their way there, the word of the cross is foolishness. Now, let's remember that God sent his son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world in order to judge the world. But why? So that the world may be saved through him. However, that passage continues and says that light has appeared, but men love darkness rather than light and will not come to the light because if they do, their sins will be exposed and they love their sins. So they will not come to the light. People love their sin and hate God. That's why they will perish. And we are told in this passage, I just summarized from John chapter 3, that in the first advent, the first coming of Christ, it is in which God shows us his mercy, his love, his care, and that he is coming to save us. Because the second coming will not be a gentle baby in a manger. He will be a warrior who will burn all his enemies upon his appearing. So what is the converse effect? It is foolishness. It is stupidity. It is ridiculous to all those who are on their way to hell. But there's a converse. Verse 18, what does it say? The word of the cross is falling to those who are perishing, but to those, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God has delighted to reveal the truth of the gospel to his elect. When the truth of the saving work of God is revealed by the Holy Spirit to a person, by the hearing of the word, by the preaching of the word, and he or she understands it, and they realize the holiness of God, they realize the grace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness that God gives them, the spirit compels them to repent of sin and to trust in Christ by faith. So when that message is received and taken positively, it is by those who are being saved. What does it mean, those that are being saved? We'll summarize it like this. The scripture talks about salvation in the past, in the present, and in a future tense. We were saved, past tense, at the point in time when God granted genuine faith, genuine repentance in Christ. And he made you righteous. That is justification for every Christian that is in the past. Then we are being saved, present tense, in our everyday life as we walk, as we fall, as we get up, as we persevere. 
as we continue in the hardships and the trials and also in the rejoicing, in the joyful times the Lord gives us. We are being sanctified. That is ongoing, ongoing, present tense. And then the Bible talks about we will be saved in relation to Christians. <clears throat> that is when we finally meet the Lord Jesus in our fully glorified resurrected bodies. That is the future glorification state. Justification past, sanctification present, glorification future. That is the guarantee that those who are being saved have. To those that when they hear the gospel, when the Holy Spirit of God reveals the truth about Christ to them, they hear and they receive and they go home justified. That is the promise that God has for such folks. John 10, 27 and 28 says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. I don't know about you, but this is so comforting. If you are a genuine believer, this, is, this should be your verse that you go to, this passage, for your consolation, for your restoration, for your hope, for your perseverance. To those who understand that they are sinners in need of a savior and that Christ has granted them that belief, that repentance, that forgiveness, that love, that care. We have the assurance that the eternal life that has been given to you is permanent. You are not left alone to fend for yourself after the Lord saves you. He says no one will snatch you out of his hand, meaning he holds you. That is a tremendous consolation. That is a tremendous hope that we know we have in Christ. Second header. What are the effects of self-righteous wisdom? The wisdom of the world that rejects the message of the cross. What are the implications of that? Verse 19 says this. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This is a composition of a citation from the Old Testament in which God promises that he will ruin the plans of the worldly wise. They're not going to go anywhere except to hell. They will not accomplish Anything worthwhile in the lens of eternity. This is a passage from Isaiah 29, Job 5, and Jeremiah 8. I think Jeremiah 8, verse 9, really captures the intention of this quote. So I'll read it. Jeremiah 8, 9. It's also in the notes. It says this. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold. They have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? This is the judgment of self-righteous wisdom. This verse here, referring to the wise men shall be put to shame. That, that is those who reject the word of the Lord, who reject the word of the cross, who reject the message of Christ. God conceals the truth to those hardened hearts in their arrogant attitudes. And further, God ultimately lets them reap the consequences of their own foolishness. They are given over to a debased mind. Go for it. The next sermon will focus more in depth into the concept of God's wisdom versus the wisdom of man. 
But for now, let us consider some final points of application of what we've learned about the word of the cross being foolishness to those that are perishing, but that to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And remember, this is Paul speaking. He also spoke about the power of God in Romans 1, 16, where he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation for who? For those who believe. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. The power of God. So what have we learned? What can we ask ourselves to reflect upon? I have two things. First, the question. What is your reaction to the message of the cross? You heard it today. You are a sinner. You will face a holy God. Unless you have Christ, you will perish. Repent. Trust in him. What is your response to that message? If your response to that message is, this is dumb. This is foolish. My friend, if that is you, you are on your way to hell. You are perishing. So I urge you, respond. Talk to me. Talk to one of the men or women in this room. Do not leave today unsure of whether the gospel is foolishness to you. This is a call to you individually. I'm not addressing this to everybody. To you individually. Is the message of the cross foolishness to you? If it is, in this very day, I don't make it clear to you to come and speak with me or with somebody here. I would fail to do my job and I will be accountable to that, to God. I urge you, if this message is foolishness to you, do not leave today without speaking to someone. Now, perhaps to some of us, the message of the cross is the power of God. If that is you, you have no one to thank but God for that. For just as it was told to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But God revealed it to you in his mercy, in his grace towards you. And it should create a response of humility and thanksgiving and servitude in our hearts. And secondly, I urge you to embrace the wisdom of God and to forsake your foolishness. Jesus, in teaching about the kingdom of God, speaking about salvation, about the urge for people to obey him, to believe him, he told the parable of the two builders. I'll read it for you, and this is what I'll close with. Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, it says this. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears his words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and it was the fall of it. That is the words of our Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would consider the words we have heard today and that we would act in obedience to submit to you, to obey you, to worship you, to repent and to honor you with the entirety of our lives. May your Holy Spirit grant us this reflection and this repentance. Thank you, Father God, for giving us your word through the Apostle Paul that we've read today that is very relevant and applicable to our lives today. Oh, Lord, we ask that you continue to be merciful to us, your children. And we rejoice that you hear our prayers because of the merits and the perfection of Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.